check, check. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hey. So usually we give people up to five minutes past the hour to start. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I know we didn't make it last time. I I lost my internet connection, so I'm sitting out in my car with, uh, I'm going to try and present from my iPad. We'll see how this works. Well, that sounds interesting. As long as you're not driving <laughs> while you're presenting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, that would be even more fun. Uh, depending on which car you're driving. <laughs> with a self-driving <laughs> Tesla, maybe, but I think it's still illegal. Yeah, my car is definitely not autonomous. Um, yeah, we got just one question from Kartik who wants to give us a brief update. Only five minutes to get started today. If this is fine for everybody, but just be really brief because they wanted to mention um, the chaos engineering white paper. It was just very highly high level give an update that it actually exists it will really be pretty short but he has to drop off early so i if okay for everybody but just give him the chance to just say this is it what we're yeah, working that, on i just mm -hmm. that works i just have to drop at like 11 20 i think or 11 25 but i think my topic probably won't take more than five ten minutes okay that, then i think we should be yeah i would then i would just let them go first and Mr. Franz, the legend himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's an introduction. Nice. <laughs> yeah, this. Okay. Let's... So, so Thomas, do you want to present anything on the operator working group today? No, I think I think there's no progress currently. Mm, okay, fine. The next time again. No, it's fine. I was just trying to outline the agenda. But I think we're we're totally fine because we otherwise we. So let's give people one or two more minutes to, to join in here. So Thomas and Alex, I think application enablement would also be something we put on the agenda for maybe then the next meeting again. Yeah, so sounds today, good. Uh, I think today with the meetings that we have, or with the topics which we have scheduled, I think we will run out, we would run out of time anyways, otherwise. Good.
So Cornelia, do you want to give any updates on the GitOps working group? You don't have to necessarily. Uh, sure, I can do that. Yeah. I'll put you at the end of today's agenda. I know this is not like very gentlemanlike, but the reason is we have two project presentations and we skipped one already the last time. And otherwise we could do the, the GitOps working group in one of the next meetings as well. No worries. If it does, if it slips out of today, no. not, not a problem. Yeah. Good. Uh, having said that, let's actually get started. I know, Kartik, you have a hard stop. Um, so everybody agreed on letting you go first. Um, discussing the chaos uh, white paper that you're planning to work on. So, yeah, I'll just let the, the group you give a brief introduction, what you're up to, uh, where they can find the current draft and, and how they can participate. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Elias. Uh, for answering my request. Uh, thanks for allowing me to go first. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Karthik from the Litmus uh, Chaos community. Um, I'll just share my screen and uh, talk for a couple of minutes about uh, this uh, new initiative that uh, we sort of started. Um, thanks to Alois for actually suggesting uh, the idea of writing out uh, this white paper. We're trying to create um, a white paper for the state of chaos engineering in uh, cloud native. And um, one of the reasons I think uh, the motivations for this is Chaos engineering is gathering speed as a discipline um, and the adoption of Kubernetes has just um, increased the adoption of chaos engineering, so to say. A lot of folks are migrating to Kubernetes. They want to do a lot of um, fault injections and they want to do chaos engineering in CI, CD. They want to do it before they go and uh, deploy their applications into production. So that's the real motivation. We want to see how the uh, cloud native paradigm has influenced the trends uh, of end users, how they're adopting chaos and uh, what they are doing with it. Um, we want to learn from the end user experiences. And uh, one of the ways we thought we'd do this is uh, try and gather folks from the uh, CNCF projects that are working on chaos engineering. Litmus Chaos, uh, which is uh, one of the CNCF and box projects, and also Chaos Mesh, which is another uh, chaos engineering project, which is under the purview of the SIG network. And um, we sort of got together and uh, exchanged some ideas and thoughts. We wanted to further um, establish what we mean by cloud native subcategory of chaos engineering. What are the general architectural approaches um, that we see uh, in cloud native chaos engineering, and also take a look at what problem users are facing and what are the reasons why they're adopting chaos engineering and how they are doing it. There are people who are still doing uh, game day oriented freestyle manual execution of chaos, and then there are folks using it in continuous delivery pipelines. Um, there are people who are integrating it with uh, GitOps pipelines. There are a lot of ways they're using it. We want to capture. Um, those uh, practices and uh, also take a look at uh, what are the most common problems faced by uh, the um, SREs um, today and try and recommend how they can avoid that. So we basically are going to uh, capture our uh, thoughts in this document. There is a working draft. Um, it basically contains a set of sections here. You can see uh, we'll be defining the goals that I just spoke about. We'll be trying to introduce uh, the concept of chaos engineering and then uh, define the subcategory of uh, cloud native chaos engineering and its current state, uh, how practitioners are looking at it. We'll summarize the uh, available CNCF projects in the landscape today and uh, try and uh, take a brief look at the approaches that they are taking to solve this problem. And also learnings around uh, uh, that we've got from the end user community, some recommendations around how they can adopt, start to adopt chaos engineering. There are some well-known uh, practices emerging, people doing chaos for observability infrastructure in the beginning as a low entry barrier and then they take it to production. I mean, they take it to the other business apps. Some of these we will try and recommend here and uh, there'll be some predictions. Uh, this is what we agreed upon. Um, and there is a Slack channel um, dedicated to collaborating on this uh, chaos white paper. Uh, it has folks from the Chaos Fish and uh, Litmus Chaos communities. And uh, 
uh, really appreciate, really um, encourage you to take a look at this and see if you would like to include more topics around uh, chaos engineering here. And uh, you can also join the Slack channel and um, th this is open for comments. And uh, we'll be happy to incorporate your uh, feedback and come up with the white paper. There's also an issue. So you can go ahead and uh, put your thoughts as issue comments here as well. We've not got much in terms of content. Uh, we just uh, got together last week. So we expect that uh, there's going to be um, more content as we go in the following weeks. Uh, we just uh, created a rough draft of how we, when and how we'll meet and uh, what might be some significant milestones with regards to this uh, white paper. So uh, you can take a look at this and uh, share your comments. We'll be happy to take that feedback and uh, move forward. I think in the subsequent um, uh, CGAR delivery meetings, uh, maybe uh, we can have uh, uh, progress updates on how we are doing here. Um, what is the current state, what are our uh, current learnings, et cetera. Yeah, so that was a very, very brief uh, intro to what we are working on. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, as Kartik mentioned, this actually came out of me asking him for the upcoming KubeCon Europe talk about what they are seeing from a chaos engineering perspective. Because with um, is it called the Litmus Chaos Hub or or to, yeah, what they are seeing, which which, which chaos experiments people are running, what they are doing. There were actually quite some interesting insights. And why don't you? team up, which I think is also great, with the Chaos Mesh team on, on, on Silk Networks to, to bring this together into a more um, condensed format. Yeah, I know it was pretty much last minute that I told you, you should bring it up to people over here. So um, yeah, obviously, as soon as you have something to share, feel free to always book a couple of minutes on, on, on the white paper. I'd also recommend you sync with the operator white paper team on best practices, what worked well, what did not work well from them. So they have obviously also learned a couple of things along the way, what did work better than, 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 than other things. So I think it's uh, Jennifer, Thomas or Omar. I think they also help. They can also help you here on how to best structure it and get it uh, aligned. They got a lot of praise by coping with the security team. So though they did a great job by themselves as well, but I think it's also well received by the CNCF the way they, they actually structured this. So I also would recommend reaching out to them, especially when you talk about timelines to get feedback on what worked and uh, what what didn't work. Obviously, KubeCon EU is out of the time horizon. That would be a very fast white paper, but maybe something around in the in, in the summer time frame. And um, just looking at this, I posted most of the links in there except for the Slack channel already in in the, in the docs. Feel also free to uh, send it out to the mailing list. I know that some people can't join usually this meeting because for the West Coast, it's really early. Um, uh, so that you have more outreach there. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing today. And let's discuss more as we as we go along. And we can then, for example, the next time we could like, take the, the, the findings that we already discussed. That would also be an interesting this discussion to get things started. And with this, I would pass over to James, who's presenting from his car today. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So for those of you that didn't hear the backstory, I lost my internet connection at my house. So I'm in the driveway. So let's see if my if I can actually broadcast from my iPad here with LTE. And uh, you let me know if you can see uh, something here. Uh, yes, we can see your screen broadcast. Good. Fantastic. It's, it's a miracle. All right. Um, so it's loading right now, but um, essentially I wanted to take you all through um, uh, some work we're doing around a product called Kinder. Uh, and let me actually exit out of full screen. I think you should still be able to see this pretty well. Um, no, and yeah, so, uh, really okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so the just to give you a quick update, I just wanted to you know appreciate the time, you all taking the time to listen and give us any guidance. Um, so uh, basically, one of the challenges that that we've we've experienced or we've seen with a lot of users is they're they're getting tired of hearing about digital transformation from vendors. Um, they're they're also getting tired of hearing about transformation easy, just modernize your apps, modify your processes, change your culture. And the actual practitioners doing this work are really 
just still asking, hey, what does that practically mean I need to do in my day to day life and, and in my application architectures and things like this. And so, um, in addition to that, there's, you know, every uh, integrator and partner and vendor has a different methodology for how to do this, how to rehost, replatform, refactor your applications. And all the thing that they bring oftentimes is proprietary. And so, um, what we've found in in the in the community as we've begun cultivating this community is that um, what people the practitioners are actually hungry to learn about is how people are doing this, it's how they're actually uh, you know for example string, strangling a monolith or car off a side car container or you know, um, you know containerizing their their applications. Um, those are topics that they're very interested in and they want to learn about, and they also are interested in having tools that are open source uh, to help with this journey, uh, not not things that require licensing or proprietary, uh, you know, have proprietary um, IP. And so that's really what we're doing in the conveyor community. Um, we're we're starting to hold meetups. Um, actually, Karthik uh, just presented uh, just the other day on one of them. So Karthik, thanks for presenting on on the chaos engineering topic. Um, but really, this is about trying to drive more of an ongoing conversation from practitioners to other practitioners about how they are going through taking their applications and getting them to Kubernetes and, and to use the CNCF projects um, more regularly. Um, so that's kind of the mission statement is bringing together community people to build these tools, share and, and share knowledge and best practices on how to rehost, replatform, and refactor your apps to Kubernetes. Um, inside that conveyor community, um, we have really five projects right now that there are there's active development on. Um, they you can see them here from right to left. So we have the forklift project, uh, which is essentially about rehosting your virtual machines to Kubebird. Um, so this allows you to actually import virtual machines in mass into uh, the, the Kubebird project. We have the crane project, which is about rehosting your applications between Kubernetes clusters. It actually leverages the Valero project to do a lot of the backup and restore of the Kubernetes objects. And then it also helps with moving persistent data between clusters. Uh, move to Cube. Uh, this was recently open sourced, um, actually uh, open sourced by IBM Research and placed into the community. Um, it is a tool that helps you replatform your applications uh, from, uh, you know, other container orchestrations. Uh, so, uh, you know, Cloud Foundry, Swarm, and other technologies where you're already containerized, but you want to move to Kubernetes. Um, the Tackle project. This is a new project uh, that has just been kicked off and is is scheduled to have their first community release in the June timeframe. Um, and it is about helping people assess and analyze their applications uh, for container suitability. So there's a there's actually a manual data entry point for uh, entering the characteristics of the application. There's a shared application inventory, and then there's a static code analysis piece that can actually determine uh, you know how well your applications are to be um, you know conform to the ball factor app kind of mindset and then all the way over to the right is Polaris this was actually developed um, by uh, some folks in a consulting organization to help measure the Dora metrics so uh, you know the um, uh, you know the, the mean time to recover the, your change failure rate and so on and this is a project that actually instruments across various uh, other uh, projects running on top of OpenShift to measure your actual software delivery performance. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the five projects that we're, we're working on. Um, you know, it's very, I would say, early days. Uh, they're all in different stages. Uh, Move to Cube has releases. Uh, Tackle will have its first community release in June, as I mentioned. Crane exists uh, and, is, and is available. Forklift is also available. And Polaris is, is too. Um, uh, you know, just I'm not the governance expert on this call, so normally hand it over. I don't know if Josh Burke is on the call. Um, but he's he's been working with um, us to uh, kind of put some governance in place in, in the community. Uh, so we do have uh, some some governance and uh, like a contributor ladder that we put out there. Uh, it's all available to be commented on as well. Um, but essentially, this the the idea is that um, you know we would have kind of uh, each community um, will really have its own. Uh, guidance that it puts in place, uh, but we'll have kind of a representative, a maintainer, and a member representative in that governance. There's a there's a link at the bottom. I'll share these slides. You can look back and provide feedback um, if you're interested. Uh, and then um, there's also uh, you know a, a, a contributor ladder approach as well that's in there um, as well. So I I did want I just want to keep it really brief and kind of give you guys an, an introduction and take actually open it up to more feedback or questions or comments. 
Um, we're on the Kubernetes Slack channel, so pound conveyor on slack.kubernetes.io. Um, if anybody wants to ever propose a meetup, we, we're very open to it. We have some pretty simple rules, which are don't don't contain proprietary technology in your demonstration. You know, make it demonstration based so that you could show people things. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, and then uh, joining the quarterly planning meeting. So we're we're starting to have quarterly planning meetings for all the projects at the same time, just to kind of get everybody engaged so that if there are integration points or, or sharing that we could do between the teams that happens and it's open to anybody. So um, we have uh, you know some some uh, financial services institutions that are gonna be joining us in the June timeframe, as well as uh, I'm from Red Hat. So the Red Hat engineering team will be there as so IBM research and some others. But um, with that, maybe I can uh, stop my screen share and ask if there's any questions, comments, we're always looking for feedback on what we should be doing. We know we're, we know we're early days, but we're, we think it's a space that's, it, there's really not a very good uh, solution for people that are looking to re-host, re-platform and refactor their apps. Um, can you share your screen again and show me the, the, the five kind of sub projects again? I can't yeah, remember yeah, all their absolutely. names. <laughs> yep, I can't either some days, um, <laughs> so let me. Let me show you those. It should be broadcasting. You can also find them on conveyor.io. Okay. I was just going to ask about one, but I can. Uh, let me go over to conveyor.io and see. Oh, okay. So okay. you said there was one um, that was looking at shared applications. Which one was that? Yeah, that's called Tackle. So there Tackle. is essentially. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's essentially kind of a uh, it has a, an application inventory that uh, applications can be added to, whether it's you know through human interaction or an automated uh, you know machine to machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so that application inventory is then good. there's an assessment piece that that is like you know asking questions around um, you know the human factors around the application that you would answer, and then there's an, an a tackle analyze, which is like the piece that hooks into that application inventory to do code analysis. Okay. Does that help them then uh, decompose? Is that the point? Uh, so yeah, so the, the idea is to make the recommendations. We eventually want to get to the ability to start to decompose, but that's a really difficult problem. So we're starting with like assess and analyze. Um, and then um, we're actually, the, the IBM research team is actually open to open sourcing several other tools. Uh, they're actually working on that right now to open source a couple of tools. One of them is called Application Container Advisor. It uses natural language processing to see if um, you know what you enter in from a human standpoint uh, relates to a specific container image. So it could kind of speed up the uh, discovery phase if there's matching container images that could potentially help you uh, containerize. So there may be some um, synergy between Ortelius and Tackle um, because Ortelius okay. is organizing the decomposed applications into domains for uh, okay. driving a domain-driven design. So then they can be shared across uh, teams. We'd love to have something yeah, on the front of that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You said it's Artelius, is that A-R-T-E-L-I-E-S? O-R-T-E-L-I-U-S. Okay, I will definitely look that up. That's an incubating project in the CDF. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Uh, I remember when we were working on the charter for SIG app delivery, there were requests from people on how they can get applications to cloud native. So we kept it in scope. Uh, we just said we're not initially going to work on it because we didn't have, frankly, quite an idea of what, what we could provide. But this looks interesting from, from a tooling perspective. So is your plan then also to have conveyor um, as a CNCF project, or do you want to just keep the community uh, closely related to what the CNCF is doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I mean, the, the guidance I've been giving to all the teams in the community is like, let's, let's get a lot of people using these tools. And I think we could sort out most of the other things later, right? Like it's not necessarily something that needs to, you know, happen right away. But um, of course, I think I, I also don't, know the CNCF well enough. And so Josh Burke is, his, he, you know, he, he works closely with, with a lot of the CNCF SIGs has been giving me guidance on this. I, you know, but I'm open to, you know, is it conveyor that would belong or is it the each sub project, you know, that would become one 
uh, you know, an, a sandbox project in the future or something, if, if, if that should come to be, right? So I don't know if it's like the whole community or if it's the projects, right, in, individually. But. So we had obviously project portfolios in the past uh, from like, especially project maturity, it can, can, kind of gets hard if you have a lot of individual projects that you have to kind of all more or less right. do the due diligence on together, especially if they're in a different uh, phase of maturity. It, it's not impossible, but the more uh, they're getting, the harder it, it, it obviously is. Um, having, if the requirement still is to have an independent more or less govern or governance model that people are already familiar with within the CNCF. I think this could be something like in a sandbox project and then maybe governed by a uh, CNCF, maybe a working group within CGAP delivery on like onboarding applications if at some point we wanted to. I mean, this might be a maybe a bit more a, a longer discussions. I'm just always a bit cautious yeah. about product portfolios because they're kind of hard to uh, um, harder to, to work with. Uh, I mean, maybe Cornelia, you have yeah. ideas about this, this as well. It does definitely sound interesting from what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I I'm, not, I'm not personally hugely concerned with portfolio projects. I think that there are quite a number of them, although this is quite wide ranging. So it's, it's very interesting, by the way. Um, so. Yeah, th I think, uh, you know what, the reason I, we kind of like created this conveyor umbrella was because we recognize that migration tools aren't necessarily long lived like platform technologies. And so, you know, one, you know, everybody's going to rehost their applications to, you know, a Kubernetes or CNCF model or what, or what have you. And then, you know, they're going to have a continuous refactoring still going on, but those tool sets might change over time. So we wanted kind of the community brand of this area that is designed to, for people that are practitioners that are constantly modernizing apps. But we know that, you know, the tools inside may end up, you know, they might have a maturity or, or, or a curve to them where eventually they're not used two, three years down the line and there's new tools that are available, um, if that makes sense, so. Yeah. So is it, uh, I've heard you mention IBM, you're with Red Hat, is it, is it predominantly Red Hat and IBM who are engaging on this project so far? Yes, yep. So it's specifically, it's IBM Research and, um, and then uh, the Red Hat team uh, that's why we put that contributor ladder in place in governance. Um, and now we're starting to go out and uh, engage with some of our, even our customers and users to encourage them to um, start to, so there's going to be some press coming out around KubeCon, around this community and like us trying to kind of catalyze this community and, and get more contrib contribution into it. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting project and uh, I should definitely keep, it, keep a close eye on this this one and uh, um, maybe have some follow-up discussions whenever we we see it fit but it does fit into the some of the initial requirements we we had there and it, i think in some areas you're also pretty close to existing projects like qbird for example that, that you mentioned when you want to bring something on this so some of those sub projects might then be maybe fitted better with them uh, but this can be a follow-up discussion so i definitely think it's interesting and it's uh, great that you're working on it it is a topic that many people are concerned with this. Maybe also other groups within the CNCF that are interested in this. I know there's a dedicated group that's more targeted towards this business and digital transformation focused um, areas. So yeah, let, 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 okay. let us think a bit about it, but it's definitely interesting. I think it's definitely uh, worthwhile having more of a discussion about this. The only sure, thing about sure. the, so, uh, the, the Dora metrics, how do you see this relating to the four keys project? Uh, that's a good question. I, th I don't think at this point, I think this is really, the, the Polaris project is really kind of, was a Skunk Works project kind of created by mm -hmm. some consultants trying to measure this for specific, you know, users and customers. So I think it could definitely relate to it. And um, I don't know if there's anything, is there a specific project inside of the CNCF? Is that the four keys project? No, the four keys project is the Google project that actually also measures the door metrics. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. absolutely. So so we're aware of their of their project, but and we're essentially measuring the same thing. So you know, are happy to I guess open to collaborating and 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 working together on that. Um, yeah. 
but we haven't had any, I, I don't know of any specific discussions that we've had with that team. The, the consulting team that actually wrote Polaris might, might've had conversations with them, but I'm not familiar with, with if they have. Um, it might just be good reaching out to, to them maybe and seeing where there are some synergies there okay. between the two projects. I know that four okay. is pretty related on Google infrastructure. Uh, especially yeah. from the database backend, so there might be also some, maybe some synergies on this project there. Okay, okay I'm, I'm looking at the time, and this time I want to give all projects a chance to present. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you for the time. Um, I Yeah, I really appreciate it. I will drop a link in the in the notes doc. I appreciate it, and looking forward to continuing to communicate on, on progress. All right, then we... Go to the next presentation for today, which is Lagoon. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I guess everybody can see my screen. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm here today to present to you Lagoon. Well, what is the mission of Lagoon? So Lagoon tries to drastically reduce the time required to bring your application to Kubernetes. And not only that, but also with all the configuration tooling and insights to actually run uh, your application at scale and securely. Now, why did we um, create Lagoon? And I will shortly explain later who we are, but let's look at what are the actual problems. We work with a lot of application developers and they need to learn or to understand Kubernetes YAML. And any application developers that comes from like the PHP world or so, if you show them a Kubernetes YAML, I've seen them running, screaming away and saying, no, I don't want to learn that. And so um, that's one of the things that we are seeing. The problem is that many tools that exist right now, they're all UI based. Uh, they're not UI based, they're CLI based. And if you work with governments and other pieces, that's really hard for them because they, they're used to UIs to click around, things like that. Then there's also no automation out of the box, meaning that if you maybe have a CLI, you need to write like a GitHub Actions or a GitLab or a Jenkins integration to deploy. And that's just very hard for some, um, for many people out there. Then also there is no real good best practice around base images, meaning which images do I actually use to deploy? Yes, there is Docker Hub, but they are maybe not secure or they're not maybe building the best practices. And another thing is many of the tools out there that currently exist to application delivery, they maybe deploy your application, but then if you need to solve a problem, you need to have logging or backups and all these things, they don't exist. So, we, as a company, we work with a lot of um, developers, and so we've built the tool Lagoon, and Lagoon is fully developer-focused. What do we mean? Um, first of all, you don't need any Kubernetes YAML knowledge, or not even Kubernetes access directly. You can learn it, you can look at what actually Lagoon creates, but there's no need out of the box to learn some of the YAML. We also have local development included, meaning you can run the same environment locally, um, as also in production or in development, meaning you have the same containers, the same images, the same system, which is hugely important for application developers that need to recreate problems that they face in the Kubernetes clusters on their local. Um, it's fully built around GitOps and infrastructure's code. What does it mean? There's no CLI that you need to run or install locally. All you do, you just push your code in a Git repository, and from the Git repository, automatically environment for each Git branch, for each pull request, will automatically be created in your Kubernetes cluster. We have a full-fledged UI that has all the same functionalities as the API and the CLI. So also people like uh, stakeholders, project managers, they all have also access to it. They can see what is running um, and not only the developers that used to have a token that have the CLI. Then Lagoon also includes base images for all different type of applications that are focused on security, ease of use. They have best practices in them that you usually don't find on the regular Docker Hub images. And Lagoon is multi-Kubernetes cluster capable, meaning it can deploy in a lot of Kubernetes clusters at the same time. And it's only fully end-to-end -end tested. That means we actually start up a Kubernetes, we deploy different applications in it, we test all the functionalities before we release new images, new, uh, new Lagoon versions. And logging and backups are automatically in included. So when you use Lagoon, um, or install Lagoon on a cluster, it will automatically start collect logs and show them to the developers so they can look at what is actually happening in their application. 
Now, how does Lagoon fit into a whole hosting stack? Um, well, in the end, we are fully based on Kubernetes. So Lagoon just has the requirement to have a Kubernetes somewhere installed, and that somewhere can be pretty much anywhere. As of today, we have Lagoon running in EKS, GK, AKS, and K3S. But in the end, there is no specific requirement on the infrastructure. So um, we have people that are working on, working on getting and running on DigitalOcean, Alibaba Cloud, wherever you want to do it. Um, Lagoon right now is focused on web applications, so it assumes a little bit that you actually want to show a website. But from a technical point of view, Lagoon just deploys containers. So you could also run some machine learning or run any other application um, that you can run in containers. And we have existing templates for very well-known um, website frameworks like Drupal, WordPress, and Laravel. And we're in the progress to creating much more. This means if you have one of these sites, you basically just copy-paste a couple of um, configuration files in your repository, in your push, and it deploys automatically. If you use an application that is not, that we don't have templates yet, you need to um, configure them a bit more than normal, but it should be quite easy to um, get your site running with Lagoon. Now, how does the Lagoon architecture work? I don't want to do a full um, an intro into how or every single piece, but basically we follow a core and remote or agent structure, meaning a developer pushes into uh, any kind of Git repository that can be GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or whatever else. And this then informs the Lagoon core or the control plane, if we use Kubernetes terminology about this. And then Lagoon Core talks to the re Lagoon Remote that is actually running in a Kubernetes cluster. So that's an agent, that Lagoon Remote that you install. It's an operator based on the operator framework that basically connects back to the Lagoon Core, meaning you can also run this Kubernetes cluster in an air-gapped environment because the connection is done from, from the Lagoon Remote to the Lagoon Core. And the Lagoon Core basically tells the Lagoon Remote, hey, there is a new deployment. It tells it um, which project, which namespace it should create, et cetera, et cetera. And then that Lagoon remote creates a Lagoon build pod, and the Lagoon build pod will actually clone the Git repository. That means the Git repository never actually goes, touches the Lagoon core, so the security of the code itself Yep, well, I lost him too. It's a great freeze. Yeah. I That's see everybody else it, moving, yeah. so I assume it's him. Yeah. But it's such a wonderful freeze, though. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, let's give him, give Michael a minute here. Most likely he's still talking and realizing that he's actually frozen. Yep. He was on such a good roll, too. Oh, oh well, hello. Okay. Sorry. Ah, yeah. You're back. Excellent. <laughs> I'm back. It's strange. All right. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Yeah. Suddenly you were I just hear joking how, how long you keep talking until you realize <laughs> that nobody's going to hear you anymore. <laughs> well, the strangest thing, I heard you saying we lost him. And I was like, no, I can still hear you. <laughs> anyway. OK. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to say is that it's really important that the Git repository is directly cloned into Kubernetes cluster. And um, that Lagoon build pods, then this is the actual piece that then creates, talks to the Kubernetes cluster. So it creates all the objects that are required, stuff like that. If When the deployment is done, it then informs the Lagoon core again, saying, hey, I've deployed what you told me. And then Lagoon core informs the developer back. So we have different notification channels that can be Slack, Rocket Chat, um, and you can see in the emails, things like that. So everything that the developer has to do is just push into a Git repository. They see a message, I'm starting to deploy. A couple of minutes later, it is deployed, and they can look at the logs, and they have their application up and running without ever needing to run any additional command. Now, where does Lagoon come from? Like I said, Amazee.io is a hosting company, and we used to deploy only Drupal. And we had the first customer that came to us and said, hey, we want to deploy Node.js. And um, Node.js has different versions, it's different than PHP, so our existing infrastructure at that time had no idea about Node.js. And at that time, also OpenShift Kubernetes came up in December 2016, and so we said, hey, let's give this Kubernetes thingy a try. And see here that we were focused on OpenShift at the point. 
Um, we then realized that what we've built um, can be open source. Like we have the approach inside the CIO, if something can open be open source, it should be open source. So we open sourced it in August 2017. And in August 2019, did a big rewrite um, <coughs> with full role-based access control support, meaning that we could actually define who has access to what. Before, it was like everybody had access to everything. And um, yeah, so we implemented that. Then in a during that time, we realized that we had more and more requests for just Kubernetes and not OpenDrift. So we then implemented this in beginning 2020. We added this and launched Lagoon 1.4 in April 2020. So you can deploy just against the regular Kubernetes. And there's no need for an OpenShift anymore. And right now, we are really close to release Lagoon 2.0, which is probably going to happen in May this year. Um, which is means that A, it's going to be more Kubernetes native, and we're also putting much more focus on people that want to use Lagoon to run it. Because right now, it was a lot of focus on the documentation on how to use Lagoon to deploy your application, and now we're focusing more on how to use your Lagoon yourself, that um, you, can, you can install it and you can deploy applications into your clusters. Now, how is Lagoon used today? Um, we have many different companies all over the world that already use this. Everything that Amazio does is fully powered by Lagoon. We have from governments to big enterprises to smaller to startups to media houses, they all already use it via us. Um, that means we roughly have 2,000 production environments, 5,000 development environments, around 2,500 developers that uh, use it and around 800 deployments a day with right now 40 Kubernetes clusters that are deployed into um, all over the world in different systems. And one of them even at AWS China, which is always a very ex interesting experience trying to deploy through these systems. Now, how is Lagoon connected to the CNCF? Lagoon already uses a lot of tools that are either CNCF incubating sandboxes or just Kubernetes tools. Um, under the hood, we use Helm, we use Fluent T, Prometheus, Grafana. We use Harbor with the image scanning. We, have the, we use the open policy agent. We use the logging operator from Banzai Cloud. We use KTOP for backup. So we really try to use everything that already exists or if it, even if it's only like an 80 or 70% fit, we use an already existing tool and maybe contribute and make it better than implementing it ourselves. And yeah, from Amazio, we are fully committed to donate um, Lagoon as a sandbox um, and follow the guidelines that are required. Um, that also includes, we have dedicated Lagoon product leads. Um, his name is Toby. He's in Australia right now, and it's 2 a.m., so we decided I'm going to present this. Um, we have developer advocates, we have product designers, we have engineers that purely solely work on Lagoon and make sure that it continues. Amazia always has a marketing team, so Amazia will also support Lagoon, the Lagoon team for marketing. And very exciting, we have the first organizations today that are technically competitors of Amazio that are looking into adopting Lagoon to powering their pass because they realize um, creating everything again from scratch is going to be very time and money intensive. So they looked around and found Lagoon and they're actively um, evaluating if Lagoon could run their um, platform as a service as well. What's ahead? Um, I mentioned the CNCF sandbox. We are mo we're finishing moving everything into the use Lagoon GitHub organization. It used to be still inside the CIO, and we want to give Lagoon its own space. We're working on its own website um, to also disconnect it more from CIO, and then we will apply as a CNCF sandbox. Um, we're looking into creating more templates for other applications. Um, we're looking into like um, communities like the Typo3 um, or other communities to Go reach out to them and learn how exactly we can we can build these templates. There's a huge security push right now. As we're working with a lot of governments, they have really strict security requirements. So we're working on running all the containers with rootless by default, enforcing network policies, have gatekeeper, use more the capabilities of harbor like image scanning and stuff like that. We're also working a lot of on portfolio management. That's basically if you have 400 websites that you need to deploy, um, that you can say, redeploy me all the sites, and it automatically does it for you. 
And like I said, we're also focusing on managing and maintaining Lagoon, meaning that if somebody wants to use it, that there's documentation, how to upgrade, how to handle issues, and things like that. And overall, we're just working on creating a community around Lagoon, and that's why we're here. Yeah, um, if you want to learn more, um, lagoon.sh is the website that currently redirects to Amaze.io. It will eventually have its own. We have an extensive documentation and the two GitHub um, orgs. And like I said, it will be all in the use Lagoon very soon. And that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yeah, let others go first here, so. If nobody starts in Azure, I'll just kick it off. So how many external contributors outside of Amazi are there on Lagoon right now? Not that it's a requirement for Sandbox, but just because you mentioned 2,300 developers. I think we lost him again, but we always lose him in a way that you're never, never sure whether you lost him or not. I think Michael has the unique opportunity when he freezes, he actually looks normal, usually people look like. Let's give him maybe a minute to... And it looks like my internet decided to die again. Sorry. Yeah, so my question was, uh, is this currently mainly driven by uh, Amazie? Because you also mentioned like having a lot of developers. So these are developers using it or are these developers actively contributing to, uh, to Lagoon? So it's mostly de developers using it. We have a couple of, in total, we have 80 contributors right now and we only have 20 employees. So there are 60 other people that have contributed, but it's really just smaller things right now in terms of like fixing bugs, um, adding some better documentation, improving some of the features. Um, but like I mentioned, these companies that are interested, they are fully also committed if they will choose Lagoon. Um, they will contribute back in like uh, one thing that we have, for example, is the GitLab integration and they want to have, they want to improve the GitLab integration. Therefore, they would fully contribute back to the tool. Mm. Uh, I mean, what did you uh, say was interested in that? Did you say who it was? Or I'm just not a? sure I'm allowed to say. Okay, Sorry. no problem. <laughs> no problem. But I just an, wasn't sure if I missed it. Yeah, no, I, but it's it's a US-based company that basically does hosting for a specific CMS. Mm -hmm. And they they also come from a world where they like spin up v uh, EC2 instances for every single site. And they want to use containers. And they are now looking into a way how to modernize their infrastructure with Kubernetes. Uh, it's interesting that you you know you called out that this is a hosting provider. Are most of your users hosting providers? Yes and no. So we definitely see some interest of hosting providers because they are basically in the business of bringing people to their hosting platform and giving your customers that you don't really know access to your Kubernetes cluster is always still a bit freaky um, especially if you have like a multi-tenant infrastructure uh, Kubernetes cluster so because of that um, the int or the the fact that you don't need to give customers access to the Kubernetes cluster is very interesting to them we do though see also like um, web agencies so customers that build a lot of websites for a lot of different customers and they need like development Kubernetes cluster that they start to use this or whole um, companies that say, like we have a university in, um, in Germany that uses it, which said, we want to give our, all the different departments, they all have websites that they need to host, and we want to give them access to our Kubernetes cluster. And again, the same problem is they have no idea about Kubernetes. So it's mostly in the environment if you have many different people that maybe don't know too much about Kubernetes, but you want to allow them to use it. Um, 
I mean, some, some other projects, by the way, could think about like working with obviously beyond projects. There's also the GitOps working group within the CNCF, which I highly mm -hmm. recommend you to work with. So Cornelia, I was pretty quiet, not <laughs> asking too many questions. Yeah, about oh, I, I was <laughs> waiting. I was waiting, and I I I, uh, I definitely noticed that, for example, Flux wasn't on your list of technologies, but you're doing a whole bunch of things that Flux does, like cloning Git repositories and sending out notifications and tooling all that up. Sure. Yeah, would love to see if you're interested in that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's definitely something that we, why we want to also go into the CNTF to maybe actually rip some of the code that we currently do, rip it out and replace it with existing other tools. Um, we really see Lagoon as like a tool that basically a, a bit opinionated combines existing CNTF projects together into something that you can install and in one click deploy. Um, and so, yeah, we the, the less code we need to maintain, um, the better. Um, yeah, Omar also mentioned Argo. Yeah, we also look at Ar we looked at Argo um, in the past, and so yeah, it's really about figuring out how could we best work together with others. Yeah, yep. and also the base. Yeah, sorry. Uh, on the base images, I think it's also looking into cloud native build packs. So how are you building containers mm -hmm. right now? Uh, as of right now, it's just a Docker build that runs inside the build pod um, that runs a Docker in Docker. Um, so it's very, I would say, archaic <laughs> right now. Um, but that's another thing that we would also look like to understand a bit more, yes. Because when we started, we the only piece that I really found that did actually building in the Kubernetes cluster was OpenShift with their source to image. Um, and now, in the meantime, yes, there have been many other ideas how to do this, also how to run like, it. Um, of course, like other Docker demons like Podman came up or Containerd that didn't exist in the beginning. And some of them also allow you to like rootless and things like that. So that's definitely another piece that we're interested in to, com to collaborate and figure out better ways to do it than just, um, yeah, start the Docker in Docker all the time. Yeah. Yeah, good and call on Alois. I was thinking about the cloud native build packs as well. Yeah, because they, I think, I think they are, they more or less follow the Heroku pattern of like a lot of those and the pivotal pattern of, of a lot of those things. Um, yeah. So another question: How complex can the applications be that you run with Lagoon? You mentioned mostly websites, which are not say that complicated from a structure. So, if how if I run a complex multi uh, complex microservice architecture that consists yeah. of a multitude of services. Is this something you, I mean, you run a, an opinionated approach if you say this is not what we want to do because this is not what a certain target audience needs. It's totally fine. Just, just curious. Yes, no, I mean, so interestingly, most applications that we run already exist of like five or six pods that need to work together. Like if you look at a Drupal, you have an Nginx, a PHP, you have a MariaDB, you have a Redis, you maybe have a Solar. So it already gets quite fast, quite complex. And that's like the standard that you just today, any bigger Drupal site or WordPress site needs these. But in the end, there is no limit um, on how many, let's say, pods or containers you could deploy inside one Git repository. Actually, Lagoon 1 uses Lagoon to deploy Lagoon. Um, we wanted to do a bit inception and eat our own dog food. Th we realized, though, this is then very hard to tell people how to install, because if you don't have a Lagoon, how do you install a Lagoon? <laughs> so that, that's why we now actually moved into Helm. So to run Lagoon core and remote, you just use Helm. Um, but Lagoon itself has around 25 um, microservices that work together. And that was deployed by Lagoon, and it worked without a problem. So you can definitely use it for more complex. And we have some customers today that run like newspaper websites, and they had uh, mo most of them are like quite complex. Like they have different front ends for different websites with one single back end and like an importer and stuff like that. So yeah, you end up running like 20, 30 pods very fast, and Lagoon easily deploys that. Yeah. By the way, uh, Flux 2 has an interesting approach where Flux 2 actually deploys Flux 2. Which is, I think, very nice. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's GitOps in itself, uh, which is kind of an exception. But you have to, to be fair, we have to deploy the operator via Helm, which obviously makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another project I would propose to look at, 
I think we will run out of time today is how you actually model these applications because OAM is definitely a project to look into. Um, Thomas, he, who's also here, will and uh, like the rest and and Alex who look into like an enable application enablement uh, working group um, here because like a, there are lots of opinionated approaches out there or that are getting started right now, which I think is great mm -hmm. and useful. Um, I think just some interoperability at some point uh, would be because that's also a, a community to en engage with. Um, they did not present today, but the last time, so happy to share links there. But yeah, I, I see it's definitely coming more and more like different types of templating mechanisms, OEM, Kubevela would be like, I think the most similar project that, that, that I could think of would really be Kubevela most likely, which mm -hmm. is also at, at an early stage um, to, to maybe engage with. Not saying that you have to as a sandbox project. This is also obviously to 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 provide some uh, some, some some feedback here. Yeah, but I think it's good to see these cool. projects uh, emerging. And again, also if you need connections to those projects, uh, we can obviously also help there uh, as well. Cool. Thank you. Okay, I think people are just, we are out of questions right now. Yeah, I mean, the criteria for sandbox are, I think, pretty straightforward and you're doing some of the right things, like putting it into its own organization. Uh, right now it has a bit of a feel that it's an amazing project and it's more like an open core which isn't a bad thing thing either or a bit more than open core here so um, I would definitely stress a bit on the, the external contribution part here and it's totally fine also for sandbox to be there just to, yeah uh, I think just as part of this having an idea on how you want to like grow especially your contributor base uh, beyond yourself I mean in independent governance is obviously one first step but you mentioned contributor letters and, and things like this which is good yeah, no, okay. we are fully aware. Like that was actually, we talked about like almost a year ago to donate it as Sandbox. And at that point it was still like too much an MACIO thing. But now with Lagoon 2, like, yeah, we actively have work where we remove everything and make sure that other people can use it. Plus we now have like the companies that I mentioned, they're now starting to actually use it, deploy the first test project. So we have real world example that other mm -hmm. people beside of us can actually use it because we obviously have like huge imposter syndrome that we feel like, no, it's always going to be, you can never run this outside, but seeing others actually do it on a daily basis is pretty cool. And I think this gave us also the belief that what we have built can be also used by others or is interesting to others. Okay, um, so we have Depends on how you see the agenda. If we go for the full hour, we have five minutes left or we don't have, or we're 10 minutes over, always a point of perspective. Cornelia, I still want to give you some a chance to quickly talk about the GitOps working group. Sure, and yeah, and uh, and I have a hard stop at the top of the hour, yeah. but it will only take a couple of minutes. So the GitOps working group, um, just a couple of updates. Uh, I think most people know that we are doing a GitOps con uh, the GitOps Working Group is hosting that, um, and that is a day zero event at KubeCon, virtual, of course. Uh, we just discovered yesterday that we completely dorked up the times, um, and uh, we had it scheduled for like 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Central European time, and so we're nudging that, we're splitting the difference so that West Coast people don't have to get up at one, but could get up, you know, can participate at five or six in the morning. So we're making adjustment on that. Uh, call for papers closed on Friday. Uh, the committee is meeting today to do its final selections and we'll be uh, publishing the, um, the agenda for that. A um, Couple of things that I do know is that the CDF, Tracy Reagan is here from the CDF. Um, Tracy Miranda, who's the executive director, will definitely be on the agenda. So she's doing an invited talk because we want to make sure that we are linking these two communities. Um, and the, the CDCon has a day zero event, which is also GitOps focused. So I'll put in a little plug for that as well, called the GitOps Summit, I think. Um, 
So that's good stuff happening. Um, like I said, the agenda will be posted in the next day or so, um, and we'll be letting people know about that those uh, submissions and acceptances. The uh, second thing that the team has been working on really significantly is the print are the principles. Um, there is a pull request in the Git GitOps Working Group repository that defines the principles, and so there has been um, both asynchronous collaboration through that PR, and that is the primary thing. Um, we have been hosting a number of uh, synchronous meetings where we can have live conversations. Those are all recorded and hosted. Um, and the results of all of those things are folded back into the PR. So anybody who can't make those um, is not at a disadvantage. Um, and I think those are the two main things to talk about um, at this point. Uh, just as uh, I should know this, but I don't. So this is why I'm asking. Do we? Did we already get this on the official CNCF calendar? Because we also have Amy. Yes. Here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, and the other thing um, maybe that I haven't mentioned is that we did tease apart um, when we submitted, uh, when we created the GitOps Working Group, we submitted as a sandbox project, which is kind of a weird thing to put with the GitOps Working Group. And the TOC said, we don't like the name GitOps Working Group, but we're not gonna worry about that. They'll straighten that out. Well, the confusion was pretty big right from the get-go. And so we have teased that apart. We now are naming the sandbox project Open GitOps. The working group cares for Open GitOps and that sandbox project is the place where all the long lasting artifacts like the principles, like educational materials, like um, uh, uh, um, any code, samples, things like that will, will be housed under that. And so we have started to clean up some of the mess that we made when we came in. Yeah, but it's a good, exciting news. And also having all of these zero events everywhere, I think it's good. And yeah, maybe uh, we, we post in the meeting notes, uh, like the current state of the principles. Uh, sure. Yep, yeah. you bet. So that, that oh, and, which them. reminds me, the one last thing is that uh, at get at KubeCon, um, we did have a talk get accepted for just the GitOps working group update, which is something that um, Chris Sanders uh, from Microsoft and I recorded just earlier this week. We were the bad folks that got it in way late, but we did get it in on Monday. Um, so we recorded that and it only was about a 20 minute recording because we wanted to leave lots of time for people to ask questions. So we have a session where we have the pre-recorded stuff where we do review the principles, as you, you just pointed out, um, in their current draft form, um, and then we'll answer questions. Okay, good. Great updates. And yes, you got to see the principles come along. Yep. And now I think everybody's happy calling them principles and no longer a manifesto. Yep. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah, which, which is just fine. I see manifesto getting used all over the place and I completely, I'm very sensitive to the fact that that triggers some folks. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag. There's still lots of people using it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and let, let's hear the, the, the link to the current principles. Okay, we'll do. Maybe it's something also to bring to the wider audience at a given point in time here, uh, what's in there, especially if they have questions. And with this, I think we are done for today. I think we'll meet again in two weeks from now. That's the week after KubeCon, if I'm right. Am I right? Mm. Yes. KubeCon's not oh. next week. No, no, actually, you were in the middle of KubeCon, so maybe we cancel. Yeah, I I, I'd say we cancel, yeah. Because if okay. it's in the middle of KubeCon, let's cancel. Yes, it is in the middle of KubeCon. Yeah, we, I lost a week in here, so uh, I will I will go ahead and uh, kill that meeting for the fifth cool yeah because it's very unlikely that people are going to join you <laughs> go to kubecon it's fine it's fine <laughs> you're still here a lot of what cloud native there that's fine okay then thanks everyone and have a nice evening rest of your day bye thank, thank you, you. Bye. bye all